Oh, I might find her, yeah. But of alive, probably not. I love her, I miss her, I want her back, I just want to hug her. I think if she did come back, I would have never let her go. <laughs> that was a very heartbroken Mary Shabbats, the mother of Rachel Syriax. She's been wondering where her daughter is for over five years. Is there something we can do to help her? And does a blanket help us crack this mystery? It's time to turn on the searchlight. Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to give you all a reminder. I have released two podcasts this week. We've got episode two of Three Men and a Mystery, where we get into the physical evidence in the murder of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett. And also episode eight of Crime After Crime, where Danielle Hallen and I discuss the world's worst alibis. I hope you will check those out. So today's case, um, this might feel a little bit like the brain scratch last Friday, and it's interesting because I don't choose them this way. Um, the cases just sometimes have these themes that run together. I almost feel like it's the universe trying to tell me that either there's something I need to learn about this type of case or I need to raise more exposure to these types of cases. Here is a photo of Rachel Syriax with the blanket that I mentioned at the start of this episode. Uh, the blanket is also missing, and this does feel like there's a very strong potential of this being a domestic violence-related disappearance. Uh, that's what I mean about it feeling a bit like the case that we covered uh, last Friday, which was the Elisa Gomez case. But we don't know where Rachel is, and Law enforcement has been working at this for over five years at this point, and it seems like they need some help. So that's why I wanted to pull this episode together, give you guys all the best information I could all in one source, give you guys the contact information that we need to help move this case forward in the description box below, and hopefully we can make a change in this case and bring Mary some of the answers that she's looking for. Let's start by learning a little bit about where this happens. This takes place in Woonsocket, South Dakota. Woonsocket is a city in Sanborn County, South Dakota, United States. The population was 655 at the 2010 census. Now, that is an extremely small population. As a matter of fact, Woonsocket is less than one square mile in total in, in terms of size. It's known as the town with the beautiful lake. But when you have such a small population, you'd think, well, shouldn't that help cases like this? We've got a much smaller pool of potential suspects, but you also have a smaller pool of resources to handle these types of cases. We've got a sheriff that I believe is very committed to this case. He's been pretty open uh, with some information. I think there's some other critical information that releasing might help in terms of eliciting tips, but in general, he's been um, pretty open with the media about his feelings on this case year after year as this case has gone on. Uh, I know that some people are critical of law enforcement and how they're handling this case. There's also a essentially a Bureau of Investigation, I believe they're called the DCI, if I remember right, that's looking into this case. We're going to hear more about their perspective by the end of this as well. But this is just one of those things. Yeah, you've got a smaller pool of potential suspects, but you have less resources potentially work in that case. And on top of that, what about the connectivity to tips? What about other information that might come from people that saw something or heard something? We're dealing with a smaller pool on all fronts. So I think that's really affecting this case in a bit of a different way than most of the cases that we take a look at here on Searchlight. Let's start with the NamUs profile on this case. Thankfully, there's already one created. Here it is for Rachel Lucille Syriax, a white Caucasian female. Date of last contact, they have it noted here as November 11th, 2013. The Charlie Project says that she was noticed on social media November 12th, at least in the morning. And as we go through this information, we're gonna hear that she picked up someone on November 12th as well. So I'm kind of curious why they're saying November 11th is her date of last contact. They also say she's mi missing from Mitchell, South Dakota. Uh, let's just jump to Wikipedia real quick. That's a city 
uh, in the county seat of Davison County, South Dakota, with a population of 15,000 people. Now, from the information I've seen, Mitchell is where her workplace was, but I believe she actually lived in Woonsocket. And I, the general belief here is that she made it home. So it's interesting because this name is profile almost seems like it's been written from someone at her workplace that noticed, hey, she didn't come back to work on the 11th and she must be missing from here. But I'm not positive that's what's really going on with the case. 30 years old at the time she, she went missing, she would now be 35 years old. She stands at five foot five inches tall, weighs between 130 and 140 pounds. Uh, for the circumstances, they kept it really simple here. Rachel Syriax was last seen the morning of November 13th in Woonsocket, South Dakota. So there's a bunch of clarifying information. I don't know why uh, the, the details are a little different at the top of the record. She was driving a gray 1995 Chevrolet Silverado pickup. Uh, and she has sandy hair, brown or maybe dyed with blonde highlights. She has hazel eyes. And for scars and marks, she has scars on her abdomen, but not a whole lot of detail outside of that. For tattoos, we've got several. On the left side of her neck, the word Bradley in black script. And here is a photo of that. Uh, so you can see that. And I do think, um, I saw a web sleuther that was commenting. They think this picture might actually be from a mug shot. Um, it could potentially be from a mug shot. I'm, I am aware that she did serve some time, but I don't know what for. Unfortunately, the um, public records for that cost money to even do a search on those public records. And I'm really not familiar with that system. So I didn't want to blow it. Outside of all that, I don't know that whatever criminal past she might have um, ties to this case. I'm not seeing that through at least media's interpretation of what law enforcement is investigating in this case, but I do think it's worth mentioning. So I just wanted to get that out there. Um, but back to the tattoos on her left hip, a blue Playboy bunny logo, lower middle back, a black tribal type heart. And then they talk about on her right forearm, two large red flowers, stars, tree, and initials RJ, and the tattoo extends from the wrist to the elbow. And they actually have another photo here. Here we go. Um, outside of that, they have the information about the Chevrolet Silverado. It's a 1995 uh, silver and black Silverado. We're actually gonna see some photos of it. It is found at this point, um, but I do include this information now because of you guys, you pointed out that, hey, if we're trying to elicit tips, maybe people will remember that vehicle from the time. Something about that might spark their memory. So uh, that is the type of vehicle uh, that she was driving at the time that she disappeared. But keep in mind, the vehicle was missing and that rather large blanket, which actually has a bit of a special meaning to her. We're gonna to get to that as we continue here. Let's start over at ArgusLeader.com. Rachel Lucille Syriax, 30, was last seen November 11th at a temporary job at Performance Pet in Mitchell. Sheriff Fridley says there's no indication of foul play. However, he also states that authorities aren't sure of the whereabouts of Rachel's husband, Bradley Syriax. Fridley said he is not a suspect and authorities aren't actively seeking him for questioning. Bit of an interesting statement, but remember this is within a month of her disappearance. But I gotta say, even for that, I'd, I'd think by then that they really wanna talk to her husband. Uh, Rachel filed a temporary protection order against Bradley in August. In the paperwork, she says she was seeking a divorce, one that he didn't want. Once again, it just sounds like this story is lining up to be a domestic violence issue that went too far right off the bat. And I'm just curious why um, we're hearing comments from the sheriff that they're not necessarily looking for Bradley at this point. Rachel says in the paperwork, her husband came to her house, pulled her hair, hit her several times in the head and face and hit and pushed her. He also allegedly threatened her with a knife terrifying stuff going on in this house. Domestic abuse has been an issue in the past, she wrote in a sworn affidavit. Cops can testify to this. The protection order, which was in effect about a month, was dismissed after Rachel didn't appear in court to extend the order. Bradley had been charged with kidnapping and violating the protection order. The kidnapping charge was dropped, but he pleaded guilty to violating the protection order and received a suspended sentence in November. He spent about a week in jail. 
Conditions for his release specified he stay away from his wife and complete batterer's classes. Now, I don't know if that's the same stint in jail, but on the 12th, she actually goes to get him out of jail. So uh, as it is, the conditions for his release that are being specified, at least for this stay in November, say that he's supposed to stay away from his wife and complete these classes. Uh, he's not doing a great job staying away from her if she's the one that goes to pick him up. Of course, some people out there are probably saying, wow, you know, why would she put herself back into that situation? Why even go pick him up if she wants to leave him and get a divorce? And him being in jail might have been the perfect opportunity for her to, um, I don't know if they were actually living together. I, it's, I know that she had her own place. I've looked up Bradley's information. It looks like he has a separate address, but that might be his family's home. So um, I believe that he was probably living in her home at the time that all this was going on. But unfortunately, there's a few details with this case that I just cannot find solid information on. So they have a Facebook page together, Rachel and Brad Syriacs. Here is a photo of the two of them. I just wanted to put that out there in case any of you are wondering uh, what Bradley looks like, or maybe that would help jog a memory. Going back to that time, did you see this person doing something suspicious in that area? Uh, possibly driving her vehicle, possibly related to this blanket. I don't know. I'm just trying to get all the best information that I can out there. Continuing at another article over at ArgusLeader.com, this one from January 9th, 2014. Pickup of missing woman found severely damaged. The vehicle, a silver Chevrolet C1500 pickup, was found with severe damage to the undercarriage. Now, unfortunately, that's about all the detail that they give us in terms of the damage. Uh, I haven't even seen a good photo of the actual damage. There is a photo of the truck here, um, but not really giving me a good sense of the damage. And even more critical than that, we're getting no description about where the vehicle was actually found. And that is one of those pieces of information that I think law enforcement might want to think about releasing just to give the public a chance at um, getting some tips called in. If we don't know where that vehicle is, how are we supposed to focus on a particular area or particular citizens to see if they can recall something along those lines uh, that seeing that vehicle or seeing something strange related to that vehicle around that so that's one of those pieces of information i just i really wish would come out the vehicle is in law enforcement possession but anyone who may have seen it on or about november 13th 2013 is asked to contact law enforcement a little bit of an interesting statement there because we've got this kind of strange timeline that's happening with the events. We have November 11th where she seemingly leaves work and I believe they were expecting her to come back and she doesn't. We have November 12th where we've got some social media happening in the morning. We have her going to pick up Bradley from jail and now they're saying specifically they're wondering about November 13th if anyone saw this vehicle driving around. Uh, law enforcement officials are asking residents of Sanburn, Beadle, and Davidson counties to look for property damage to fences, fields, or secondary roads that may have been caused by the vehicle. They're asking three counties to look for that damage. I don't know why they're discounting the, the fact of the location where it was found, but it, it seems like they're, they are. They're really just looking anywhere for any damage that could have been caused to that. Uh, that's another thing. If we could potentially see some of the damage maybe, or if it could be analyzed in some way, maybe that can help them drill down to specific areas. If there's mud on the undercarriage, can that be analyzed uh, to, to try to be regionalized where that type of mud comes from uh, or plants of any kind that might've got caught up in the undercarriage? So the investigation continues. Helicopter search provides no new leads. That's in March of 2014. A highway patrol helicopter searched the wound socket area. Um, looks like someone's autocorrect went nuts here. They're calling it moon socket. Uh, they were looking for any anomaly that wouldn't logically be there. The snow had melted, so it was an opportune time to search the terrain, said Sheriff Fridley. He also asked private pilots in need of hours to help aid the search effort. There are no further plans to take the state helicopter up for another search. The Sanborn County Sheriff's Office interviewed Syriax's husband, Bradley, in mid-December. So, Kind of interesting. So basically, at the time frame of that previous article that said they didn't need to talk to him, but they didn't know where he was, they actually did make contact with him and speak with him. Uh, but they are noting in this that he wasn't a suspect in the disappearance. 
In April of 2014, we have another very strange occurrence. The home of a missing Woonsocket woman was vandalized Sunday night, and authorities are unsure why. Vandals shattered a window, entered 30-year-old Rachel Syriax's home, and broke a table and light fixture. Nothing was taken. The vandals also spray-painted Riverside for Life and an expletive on the front of her home. The expletive that they wrote on the front of the house is F the pigs. So it's obviously a message to law enforcement. And below that, it says Riverside for life. Um, you know, on the face of it, it sounds like this is something that could be potentially gang related, some type of tag. But I have to say in terms of tags, I've seen a lot of tags in my day. I grew up in some areas where there was a lot of gang activity. Uh, it is not high quality, let's just say. The writing is really, really sloppy. Uh, it's only one color. It looks like something, if I grabbed a black can of spray paint and walked out front, it looks like something I would do in about two minutes, uh, just spending absolutely no time doing it. So I'm not sure if this is legitimately some type of gang tag or if this is meant to throw off the investigation in some way, but I'm kind of leaning in that direction. Uh, Sheriff Fridley doesn't know what the phrase means or if it's connected to the disappearance, but he said, we're hoping it might mean something to someone. That's an interesting statement because I would think if there was gang activity tied to some type of name like that, Riverside, I would think the sheriff would probably have some idea about that. And it seems like he doesn't. Let's continue over at KSFY with a new clue that comes out March 2015. And here is a picture of Sheriff Fridley holding a photo of that blanket that I mentioned earlier this episode. A picture may be worth a thousand words, but this photo contains the latest clue in the disappearance of Syriax, a quilt given to her as a special gift. Sheriff Tom Fridley said it was when she got out of the penitentiary. They make quilts for special occasions and other stuff, and they do beautiful work. It was given to her specifically, so there was some extra pride in it for Rachel. Her case also has special meaning for Sheriff Fridley. Her dad and I have known each other for a long time, and I've known her since she's been small. That's how I know it meant something special to her, because she asked me to come over to the house and see it after she had received it, Sheriff Fridley said. The blanket was missing at the same time she was, and we've been chasing leads down, and we decided that this would be maybe something somebody had seen. Sheriff Fridley said Rachel's husband is still considered a person of interest. Another article from KSFY.com. The search for Rachel Syriax continues. This one is from 2015. Two years ago, a wound socket woman went missing. Clues continue to pour into the Sanborn County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Fridley said there are several theories. Was Rachel thrown in the James River? Was she buried or possibly run over? The case file continues to grow as Rachel's husband remains a person of interest. Tom Fridley said she was at Performance Pet and hadn't returned to work. She was in her on the day he got out of jail. Sometimes a lead comes in and it points to another person, so we look at it and try to evaluate. Maybe we missed that person to begin with. Strange with that last comment, I almost feel like he is maybe not necessarily blaming himself, but it's almost like he's worried that he might have missed something early on in the investigation. People are still thinking about it. There's optimism that maybe one of the puzzle pieces will come sliding in. And yes, there is optimism. There's people out here watching this video right now uh, thinking about this case and hoping that we do see it solved very soon. Over at MitchellRepublic.com from 2016, three years later, the picture of a missing woman is still the screensaver on Tom Fridley's cell phone. We're always hopeful that this is the one, this is the right piece of information, Fridley said. It's just been a long time waiting for this Christmas present. The pickup was found, but the truck hasn't produced any tangible leads. Um, I was really thinking about that, hoping that there would be something that the truck could tell them about the investigation. But considering that if it is Bradley, they've been in a relationship. So if his DNA is found in the vehicle somewhere, that's not a big deal. That's not going to be helpful at all. Um, analysis about what happened to the undercarriage, I think, would be their best bet. But it looks like that isn't really giving them any good information, especially with them asking, you know, people over three counties to, to check for, you know, potential areas of damage. So definitely not leading them in a particular direction there. It's a shame because typically a vehicle in a missing persons case 
will at least give us a sense of direction that either the person was in. We've seen several cases where uh, the person is found near a vehicle, or if someone did something to that person, it will sometimes give us a clue about uh, where that person had been or possible motivations. Was it close to uh, a resource of theirs, a family member of theirs? Maybe it was their way to get home, things of that nature. But we don't have the information about where this vehicle was found, so we can't really uh, elicit those types of tips, which I think is the next level in this in terms of trying to get help. Uh, another article from the three-year mark. Officials recently searched a small area of land near an irrigation ditch in Beetle County. Sheriff Tom Fridley says a team from Nebraska with ground-penetrating radar helped out. Fridley says the equipment is capable of detecting if a person is buried in the ground. He says information was gathered, will be analyzed to determine if the site should be further investigated. Unfortunately, nothing would come out of that lead as well. Another article at KSFY, investigators still searching. This one is from 2017. You just kind of live, just breathe, and go day by day, Rachel's mother, Mary Shabbat, said. The San Bern County Sheriff's Office and Division of Criminal Investigation, DCI, are continuing to work on the case. The DCI got involved in December of 2013. We have obviously taken a hard look at her husband, Brad Syriax. He actually got out of jail on that same day, November 12th, 2013. We did do a number of interviews with him. Initially, he claimed he didn't know anything about her disappearance. Eventually, he did admit she did pick him up from jail and brought him home, DCI agent Tyler Newharth said. So if we're putting together the order of events here, we know that she picks him up on November 12th, and we actually know that they go back home. And this is kind of tying back. I think that's why they included this picture here of the blanket that's missing as well, because the blanket is obviously from her home. Um, and once again, pointing to the original thing we talked about with the NamUs profile, it seems like she actually went missing from her home in Woundsocket with this particular blanket and the vehicle. Vehicle has been found. Her and the blanket have not been. Brad Syriax is still technically married to Rachel. They have three children who have been since adopted by new parents. Newharth said Brad was the last person who saw his wife. So it's just, it's really clear that media is focusing on the aspect that Bradley could be involved and law enforcement has a lot of focus on the aspect that Bradley can be involved. We're really not hearing of any other potential situations going on here. Uh, I have seen absolutely no mention in any of these articles about the potential for Rachel to have run away herself um, had some other type of life that she left this one for something along those lines, not, not even a blip, not even just a comment of someone theorizing, well, maybe that's what's going on here. The focus in this case is very strongly on Brad. And I think because of that, uh, we need to ask people in that circle, maybe that know him, potentially even family members of his to really search within themselves. And if you have some piece of information, that can help Rachel's family come to peace with what's happened to her, please find it within yourself to do the right thing and send that information in. Um, like we mentioned, we're talking about an area that is pretty small, doesn't have a whole lot of, of people that actually live there. If it did occur there, the chances that someone saw something might be might not be very strong at all. The chances that Bradley might have spoken to someone within his circle of friends or his family is probably our best bet. So I really want to put that message out there um, and ask you guys to share this video. If you happen to know people that you think might know Bradley, send this video to them. Let's re-raise the exposure. Let's ask them to please find it within their hearts to send in that information. I really believe someone has the key to this case. Um, I just don't want this family to have to wait 20 years to, to get the answer. I would label him a person of interest, and I would still call him a suspect, Newharth said. As of February 2017, Brad is at the Rapid City Community Work Center after a long, a year-long stint in prison. He was in prison for a year for third offense violation of a protection order with his new girlfriend. He is out now serving in community transition program. We see this frequently with these domestic violence related cases where we have multiple charges um, 
related to those types of issues. And unfortunately, this case is no different. Jennifer Hiles is a friend of Rachel's. She said she continues to hear rumors about where Rachel could be. I've heard so many different stories about what for sure happened. I think it all kind of wraps around the same thing. I think it had to do with drugs, and I always hear something about that she could be in a well, I guess. The DCI has looked into the rumored well. Again, investigators found no sign of Rachel. Um, and that's the only message that I've seen in reviewing the media on this case about anything drug-related going on here. And I don't know um, why that would be spinning into this story when obviously we just talked about how this thing has been so focused on a domestic violence type situation that could be happening in this case. But I do think it's important to kind of open up our minds to the other possibilities that might be going on here. Um, yeah, she went and picked up Brad. They went home. We have no idea what happened after that fact. And if there is some aspect of drugs being involved here, it could be that Brad doesn't want to be honest about what happened after the fact because he might implicate himself in some other type of crime. Um, but could any type of drug-related crime really be as bad as essentially having law enforcement think that you're the guy responsible for murdering someone? I don't know. I don't know if, if I believe that that would be a, a spot for him to, to kind of stay stuck in. But uh, here is a, another photo of the two of them. I'm just doing everything I can to try to jog some of those memories out there. Over at dgglobe.com, November 13th, 2018. Tuesday marked the five-year anniversary of the disappearance. And South Dakota law enforcement leaders say they are continuing to work the case. South Dakota Attorney General Marty Jackley stated... State and local law enforcement continue to receive tips and are actively following up on leads in Rachel's case. We ask the public to continue to be vigilant and aware of their surroundings. Anyone who believes they have information is asked to contact law enforcement. Since her disappearance, law enforcement has searched various sites, including private scrapyards, ditches, farmland, and public hunting areas looking for signs or leads. One thing I'm wondering about, which we have heard nothing about in this case, did she have a cell phone? Has there been any ping traces, any GPS information, even phone calls analyzed, anything like that? Once again, no level of detail, but uh, a case this recent, I would like to think that she had a cell phone. Does Bradley have a cell phone? Have they looked into that, trying to trace where he had been after he was released? Uh, just a couple of ideas I wanna put out there, but unfortunately we don't have any details or answers to that. Back at Argus Leader, also for the five-year anniversary, essentially, of this happening. We haven't given up, Fridley said. We still need to bring somebody home. We believe she she's probably not alive. We are still optimistic we will find something, but it is hard to keep optimistic. Now, five years later, after the fact, it seems not much has changed. Leads have come in, Fridley said, but most are kind of a rehash of some of the same old stories. We haven't found leads that have helped us find her, he said, but at least people are still aware and concerned. And that's why we do this, because we want to raise awareness and keep it high on cases like this. Uh, this is the Charlie Project page. I always appreciate how hard Megan works on these, especially with pulling all these photos together. So I just wanted to spend a moment here to show you all the different photos of Rachel, as well as some photos of her tattoo, photo of the truck, and a couple photos of the blanket. And the, the, the quilt actually has a particular patch on it with some writing. Um, I can't quite make out everything it says. It does say Rachel on it. I believe it says Hope Circle 2013. Um, I can't make out what the top line says. It looks like it says something like friendship star, something along those lines. Um, but that is the best detail that we have. There is a Facebook page for help find Rachel Syriax. I'll have a link to that in the description box below. There is a few web sleuths threads. One of them was basically just a repost. It only literally had one or two posts. So I'm not including that one, but there is one that's three pages links to all kinds of different articles you might want to check out. And on top of that, Rachel also had a separate uh, Facebook account. I'll have that in the links down below as well. So what do you think, Brain Scratchers? Do you think media and law enforcement have it right in terms of eyeing Bradley so hard? Do you think there's something else at play here that we didn't touch on? It's kind of hard because 
the media in this case has been so focused on him right from, you know, basically a month out on her disappearance. But is this a case of that's just them reporting on the facts and the facts are actually pointing us towards that truth? Or are we completely missing something? Kind of what Sheriff Fridley alluded to in the middle of those articles I was reading, that maybe he missed something at the beginning that could spin this whole case in a different direction. If it is Bradley, how do we crack this thing? How do we get those answers so that justice can be served if it needs to be served, or at a minimum, so that Rachel's family has the answers that they've been looking for? That's where I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's talk about all that in the comments down below. I know not all of you follow me on Twitter, but YouTube has been really clamping down on demonetizing my channel. I don't know why. I don't know what has changed recently, but something has. So it is more important now more than ever uh, to help keep the channel supported if you want to keep me here helping on these cases, helping the other families. So please consider joining Patreon or giving money to the channel through PayPal. You can do all of that over at www.lordandarts.com. And I want to thank several people that decided to step up and do that recently, starting with Darcy, Edna Powell Buttery, who also increased her pledge on top of that. Thank you, Edna. Crystal Kelper, uh, Ariana McKenzie Lacastro. Thank you so much, Ariana. Angela Bordak and Lucinda Mann. Thanks to each and every one of you for supporting the channel. It's, I say it all the time, but it actually is becoming more and more true. I literally cannot do this work without your support and your help. And I really appreciate that there's so many of you out there willing to do that. Take care, everyone. I'll see you back here on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch on the Lord and Arts channel.